Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. I love my church. I love this time of year. I love seeing the, the missions flags up and around the auditorium. And uh, I love our school and the opportunity that I have tonight uh, to preach God's word. I don't take it lightly. We're going to be in Romans chapter number one. I've got two places uh, bookmarked in my Bible for the uh, service tonight. So Romans chapter number one. And then also, if you want to uh, mark your spot there in 1 Corinthians chapter number six, we'll be in both those places tonight. But primarily in Romans chapter number one. And hopefully you've had a chance uh, to find your spot there. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's word. Romans chapter number one. And we'll begin reading in verse number, verse number 17. For there in it, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that, when, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the time that we have to gather together around your word. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the clarity that we find even in this passage. And uh, we pray that you would speak to hearts tonight. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, the theme this year for our church family has been to declare the gospel. And that is Paul's purpose and intent on writing the book of Romans, to declare the gospel. He was writing to the church in Rome about 57 AD, likely during his third missionary journey. He's writing uh, possibly from Corinth, uh, Corinth, and he's writing to the Christians. We read earlier in this passage, to all that be in Rome, Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And these Christians were Christians that he had never met, though he had a des strong desire to see, to understand. And he wanted them to see and understand and experience the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these were not easy times for the Christians living in Rome. And so what he's going to do for them and the message that he has for them, for these saints in Rome, was the gospel. By the way, as Christians, we don't ever get over the gospel. We need the gospel preached to ourselves constantly and daily. We need the gospel. Without the gospel, there's no peace. There's no peace of God. There's no gratitude. There's no compassion. We need the gospel. And in his opening remarks in verse number 14, he writes that he is indebted to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. Verse number 15, he says, I'm ready now to preach the gospel. In verse number 16, we find that, 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 that awesome verse where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And so Paul is kind of wrapping up his introduction here, and he begins to make the first in a series of arguments. It's important to realize this when reading through the book of Romans. Uh, Romans has been compared to uh, before and likened to a legal hearing. So Paul is going to uh, propose an argument here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is establishing the guilt of mankind before God. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, we read and we find and we observe that the Gentiles, the unbelievers, are guilty. We, we uh, then discover that the moralists, the religionists, those who are, are good people, even, even their best day, they're guilty before God. 
Those who are stooped in their religion, they are guilty before God. And we come to Romans chapter 3, if you're familiar with this, these verses. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh God, for all have sinned. We read in Romans 3.23. And so Paul begins uh, this argument by detailing, number one, the truth of God revealed. The truth of God revealed. Now, revelation is, by definition, it is an act of or revealing the communicating of divine truth. So something, something that was previously unknown. So uh, Paul it, it begins by uh, uh, explaining the revealed truth of God, by articulating the revealed truth of God. Specifically in verse number 17, which we read a moment ago, we read of the righteousness of God being revealed. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What is this referring to? What is therein? This is speaking of the gospel. For therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Uh, so it is not only... It is, it is only because of the gospel that we are even aware of the righteousness of God. So the reason we are aware of the righteousness of God is because of the gospel. This verse here is a direct quote from the book of Habakkuk. It's found three times in the New Testament. This is really the catalyst for uh, the, the Reformation. And Luther read this and uh, understood, came to understand. At first he was puzzled, but he came to understand that the righteousness of God here is speaking of imputed righteousness. God's righteousness given to us from faith to faith, from start to finish. So this is what the gospel does for us. It reveals for us how we can be right with God and the righteousness of God. It is God's righteousness imputed to us is the only way we have any standing before God because we're all sinners. We've all sinned. So this is the good news, that, uh, and, and, and because of this, nothing we could ever do could ever swing the gavel of God's justice to declare us righteous. We are only declared righteous, sometimes the term we use is justified, because of Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Amen. In the Old Testament, they were keenly aware of the righteousness of God. It kept them at a distance from God. Worship was always conducted at an arm's length. But through Jesus, we can be clothed in righteousness and we can boldly approach God. So we find here, uh, Paul is beginning this argument, beginning his letter by, by reminding them of the righteousness that has been revealed to them, the righteousness of God. And he is a righteous God and he is a holy God. And the only way that we can approach him by faith is with the righteousness that we are clothed in by the precious Son of Jesus Christ and His blood. So we see the righteousness of God is revealed, but then we move further on and we see that the wrath of God is revealed. We're moving into a section of Scripture that paints for us a bleak portrait of humanity. Uh, the this, this second half of, of Romans chapter number one is a far cry from good news. It's actually a Bad news. It's kind of a heavier passage to even read through if you've read through Romans chapter 1 more recently. Well, how would you like it, though, if your postal worker, your postal male man, I almost said male woman, but that's not a thing, right? So not, what if your postal worker decided that they were going to vet your mail and decide which letters were going to come your way, and they only wanted good letters to come to you? So anything that said final notice, they would just keep that and not put it in the box. Uh, or if it said bill due, they just wouldn't put it in the box. How many of you would like that? You know, uh, I'd like for them to take all the wedding information, uh, invitations away. You know, uh, but if you had, if you had a mail uh, a mail carrier that made those decisions, you wouldn't say that's a good mail carrier. You need to know that, right? So you can address it. What about a doctor that knew something? some bad news about you, but didn't want to share it with you because he didn't want to share the bad news. So when we come to this passage, we're going to see the bad news of humanity, but there's, without the bad news, there's no appreciation for the good news. There, uh, Romans chapter 1 has said, one commentary said it this way, Romans 1 is the backdrop on which the bright jewel of the gospel shines all the brighter. Spurgeon said, there's an account here, such as you do not find anywhere else in the whole of the Bible of the history of the human race. It is, I suppose, the most perfect summary of the history of man that can be found even in the Bible. 
I've mentioned this before in church. I love Yosemite. It's a great place. I was talking to teens the other day, and I asked many of them, how many have ever been to Yosemite? I was surprised how many had not been. Uh, We live in a weird state, yes, but we live in a beautiful state. And if you get a chance, go and visit Yosemite. If you visit Yosemite and you come through Fresno, uh, there's the, the entrance that leads you into the national park is called Tunnel View. It's called Tunnel View because first you drive through a long, dark tunnel. And you drive through this tunnel and there's nothing spectacular about it. But when you come out on the other side of the tunnel, it is truly brilliant. There's something about tunnel view which makes the revealing of Yosemite all the more beautiful. A dark tunnel with limited perspective gives way to a breathtaking view. Well, Romans chapter number one, the portion that we're going to study right now, is the, the, the dark tunnel that leads way, that gives way to the brilliance of the gospel. And then we read here in verse number 18. So I mentioned that the righteousness of God is revealed, but also the wrath of God is revealed. Look at verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is not a very popular topic today, even among Christians. I don't think I've rarely, if ever, seen someone just post to Instagram or post to Facebook. Here's a a picture of a pretty lake and a quote of the wrath of God. I haven't seen that. Um, But God's wrath is fierce and it is perfect. God's wrath is his holy displeasure and righteous vengeance. It's the counterpart to God's righteousness and God's love. These couldn't exist one without the other. If you truly love something, you will have wrath directed at something else. Uh, Sometimes I use the illustration, I have a garden, and I love my garden, so I have to hate the weeds. I love my family, and so I hate the idea of anyone taking advantage of any one of my children. I hate that with, I believe, a a, a godly hatred. So God's wrath, though, is different from ours. His wrath is is fierce. I mentioned a moment ago, uh, you know, having a righteous anger. And the Bible speaks of that. So our anger can sometimes be righteous, but it's not always righteous. We've all acted in ways or spoke out in ways where outbursts of anger and rage and you said something. I've had to go and apologize to my kids. I've been frustrated at times. Well, God's wrath is not like an outburst. It is a response to wickedness and sin. It is fiercely perfect and necessary. God's wrath is, is unlike his love in that where we read in scripture, God is love, but we do not read that God is wrath. The wrath is necessary because of sin and evil that exist, and it is God's righteous response to that. God's wrath, we read in scripture, can be provoked. God's love is not provoked, however. There's nothing in us that provokes and prompts God to love us. You know, maybe you, maybe you got a new pet, and you're like, oh, it's so cute, and the more, the more uh, the, that, that, that pet is around your house, you just love the pet, or maybe even a child, and you're just like, I can't, I can't get enough of it. The more I see this, this, this person, I just, I love them all that much more. God does not have that same response to us. He loves us because he chose to love us. But his wrath can be provoked in response to our sin. So we see a few things in this verse. First of all, that the subject of God's wrath is deserving. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So look at the the source. The source is from heaven. That cues you to the fact that this is a different type of a wrath. It's from heaven. It's a godly, righteous, and holy wrath. It's a divine wrath. But it's also a wrath that is directed at a subject that is deserving. It says, it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So ungodliness, this is against God, and unrighteousness, just doing wrong, committing evil against God. That is the object, rightfully so, of the wrath of God. So we'll, we'll see more on God's wrath in just a moment. But, but, but God's wrath is mentioned throughout Scripture. And it is just as perfect as his love. And so the wrath of God. But then the next thing that we see here revealed in this passage is the knowledge of God. Look at verse number 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest or revealed in them. For God showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal Godhead. 
Uh, so we, 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 here we come to Scripture. We find this revelation of God. Now, now there's two, two revelations of God that we, we observe in Scripture. And here we find what we call a general revelation. This is the creation. Uh, we read in Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And so God has revealed himself to us generally through, through two means. First of all, creation. The heavens declared. There's one time Napoleon was walking on his ship and he heard some men that were, that were mocking the idea of God and he turned to them and he pointed to the stars and said, first you'll have to get rid of those if you want to get rid of God. Because the heavens declare uh, the works of God, the existence of God, the glory of God. And this is general revelation. If I were to come and bring in front of you a portrait and say this is a beautiful portrait, it would point to the fact that there was someone that painted it. And so the portrait reveals the fact that there was a painter. The creation points to the fact that we have a God that is powerful, that is a God of order. You know, sometimes we, we talk about the fine-tuning of the universe, and it really blows my mind how, how uh, purposefully and intentionally God designed the earth and how, how wonderfully it's put together. I was reading the other day that a neutron, which is apparently very small, I read this uh, the other day, I'm not a scientist, but in case you were wondering, they're very small. If you take a deep breath, when you, when you breathe in, here's all the numbers, I don't even know, I can't, only, I can't count this high, so we just have to put the numbers on the board. That's how many atoms of oxygen you breathe in. If every single one of those atoms were expanded to the size of of a football stadium, the nucleus in the middle would still be the size of a pea. Neutrons are tiny particles within the nucleus that are found in all atoms except hydrogen. And did you know that neutrons are heavier than protons? I didn't know that until I looked this up, but here's what was interesting to me. A neutron is, and here's another number for you, this much times more heavier than a proton. If you were to shift that number just a little bit none of us would be here right now. Be because the stars would burn too quickly, the earth would be full of helium, scientists say, and yet this is how God created it. I, we, I love the fall, I enjoy our seasons, and I love, uh, if we were just a little further away from the sun, we would all freeze. If we were a little closer, we would, we would uh, burn up. If the, the sun wasn't at the right access, we wouldn't enjoy the seasons that we do. And yet, all of this points to a creator is what we find here in Romans chapter number one. So we have general uh, revelation. And this is why sometimes when people go outside and they, they, maybe you've heard this before, where they get into nature, they go camping and they're in a beautiful area and they'll, they'll say, or maybe you've said before, you just feel close to God. Well, there's a reason for that because the heavens, God's creation points to a designer and to a creator. God has also revealed himself to us in our conscience, given us a, a moral, objective conscience that we know when we do wrong and we, we, we are aware of that. So God has, has made us aware, uh, has revealed himself to, 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 uh, to us generally through creation and conscience and especially through God's word and Jesus Christ is what we call special revelation. And so general revelation can point us to God and the existence of God and the understanding of God, but it is, it is through special revelation, the word of God or Jesus Christ in the flesh, that we can experience salvation. And verse number 19 says then, we read, because that when they were known of God is manifest in them. That's the conscience, for God showed it unto them. And then we read here at the end of the verse, so that they are without excuse. And so again, we're just kind of uh, working into this passage, the fact that God has revealed the fact that he is a righteous God. You can only approach him with the righteousness of his son. God's wrath is also revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. We'll get to that in a second. But God, just the knowledge of God, the understanding of God, the awareness of God is revealed. 
Thomas Jefferson once said, ignorance of the law is no excuse in any country. If it were, the laws would lose their effect because everyone would plead ignorance. And so what Paul is saying here is no one has any excuse. You are without excuse. God, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, if you've ever breathed a breath of air, according to Romans chapter number one, you are without excuse. God has revealed himself to you through creation, through conscience, through scripture, through Jesus Christ. And so we see the truth of God has been revealed. But then we continue reading and we find in verse number 21, the truth of God rejected. So God has made his truth available to us. We are aware of his truth. He has revealed himself to us. But then we find in Romans chapter number one, this truth being rejected. We read in 21, because that when they knew God, I want you to think of that. They knew God. When they knew God. The, the language here shifts a little bit. Uh, Romans is, is uh, Paul begins Romans talking about uh, you and us. It's very personal. And then, and then we get here and we read, they knew God. They knew God and they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves wise they became as fools. So, so how is then the truth of God rejected. We see right here that there was a denial of God in their hearts. They knew God. Who are we speaking of? The ungodly and the unrighteous. You know, sometimes, uh, uh, unfortunately, a, a young person will stray from, from church and will come back questioning a lot of things that are taught even in God's word. And by the way, I, I, I love uh, even our youth group and sometimes Brother Toby Ingham will come in. We like questions. The question is revealed to us, a mind that is engaged in thinking. But sometimes what will happen, someone will leave and depart and come back with a lot of, not just even questions, but a hardened heart and accusations and this doesn't make sense. And, and what often is revealed is someone who's pursued ungodly, unrighteous living and, and, and which has led then to a suppression of truth is what we find here in this passage. I read the phrase a moment ago, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What does that mean? It's literally speaking of the suppression of truth, the choking out of truth. So this is someone who knew God, who had the truth declared to them, now suppressing, suffocating, putting down the truth. This is what rejection of truth looks like. Who hold the truth and in righteousness. So in your heart, in your head, you know the truth, but your lips no longer, if ever, profess the truth. The truth contradicts you, so you suppress it, you mock it, you eventually exchange it. So what we call accommodating theology, changing your beliefs to accommodate how it is that you want to behave, even if that behavior is ungodly and unrighteous. Right. Suppressing the truth. Suppressing the truth is a lot like holding down a spring. It takes effort. You have to constantly hold that spring down and suppress that truth. And that's, what ha that's what's happening in our world today, the suppression of truth. This is Romans chapter number one, the Gentiles, the ungodly. They are guilty before God. They are aware of God. God has revealed himself, his righteousness, his wrath, his knowledge is revealed to them, and yet they suppress it. They push it down. The denial of God in their hearts, but then that leads to the dethroning of God in their life because they glorified him not as God. We were created for his glory. That is the ultimate reason for our existence. The chief end of man is to glorify God. So there's this denial of God, then this dethroning of God. We'll speak more of worship here in just a moment. So God is, God is denied. God is then uh, dethroned. We're not going to give God the glory for which he is due. And then we read here the beginning of this downward spiral into sin. And I want you to notice the first few steps in what this looks like. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So here's the progression here in scripture. We find them, first of all, unthankful, unthankful. Then, vain in their imaginations. Here's the idea of this concept. You've pushed God out of your mind. Now let's fill it back up with something else. 
You've pushed God back out of your mind, so now let's, let's come up with a reason for his reason for existence. I was, I was reading one scientist, and uh, they were asking her, she was conducting, and this is just recently, in the state of Hawaii, they were watching a meteor shower, and someone asked her a question along the lines of fine-tuning of the universe, and asked, how is it possible that we live in such a place just perfectly created for humans, for us to thrive, just, just the balance and the, the fine-tuning of even the place where we exist? And her first answer was, well, some could say it's God, but I'm an atheist. And she gave another reason. Whatever that other reason was, was a vain imagination. She's pushed God out and she's replaced it with vain imagination. So vain imaginations, which leads to a heart being darkened, professing themselves to be wise. The irony is they're fools. The truth is revealed and the truth is rejected. But that always leads to, thirdly, the truth being replaced. What happens when people refuse to acknowledge God and depend on Him as God, we do not stop worshiping, we just change the object of our worship. The way that God created us is we were created to worship. We we are ever worshiping. It's not a matter of if we will worship, it is a matter of what will we worship. And the reason that God is dethroned, that throne does not stay vacant. The reason that God is dethroned is so something else can take the place of that throne. God doesn't want preeminence in our life. He wants uh, our prominence. He wants preeminence. He deserves preeminence. He deserves us to worship him and worship him alone. And we continue reading. Look at verse number 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, the birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Pause here real quick. Why is Paul here singling out homosexuality and sexual sins? There, there are a lot of sins that are naturally evil. The sin that he is highlighting here shows the depths of perversion because it is an unnatural evil. Uh, uh, Kent Hughes in his book uh, said that 14 out of the 15 emperors in Rome were homosexual to some degree. Uh, This was something that was uh, 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 practiced in Roman and Greek culture. The, the, The text here, as we read through it, pay attention to how specific this is. I'm told in the Greek it's even more specific. Males and females. To leave leave no question. Some would say, well, you know, Jesus never spoke against homosexuality. Jesus spoke for family. Jesus quoted from Genesis chapter number 2. In doing so, he affirmed male and female and and family. He affirmed it. Jesus also never spoke against rape or, or nuclear weapons. But he affirmed family. And this is an example of the truth being exchanged for a lie. So God gave them up under their vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men having the natural use of the women burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their heir, which was me. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, they're pushing God out. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, bait, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing, listen to this, this is the full extent of it, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. This is the depravity that we find in human nature. This is the depravity that we find here in Romans chapter number one. Now I want to pause here real quick and tell you that the book of Romans, Romans chapter number one, is not a set of binoculars for you to look at other people that sin differently than you. This is the gospel, right? Um, This is the whole point. We need Jesus. William Newell said, it will not only fail to help us, but it will seriously harm us to study this awful arraignment of God against human sin unless we apply ourselves thereby discovering our own nature. How do we know this? Well, if you keep reading in Romans chapter 2, it says, therefore, thou art inexcusable. We are worthy of the same damnation as everyone listed here. It is our sin that separates us from God. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. So you read through that list and you think, oh man, that's not me. No, that is us. And that is why we need the gospel. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 in a minute. But I love the phrase, and such were some of you. And I'm so grateful that the the power of the gospel uh, saves can save any sinner. There's no one that's too far uh, gone that the gospel cannot reach and cannot save. The God's saving arm is not short, that he cannot save, the Bible tells us. And so, but Romans chapter number one is not just a set of binoculars that we look at other bad people. This is us. So Paul goes through the, un, the, the unbelievers, the Gentiles, the, the people who were moral, the people that were religious, and, and all of us are in the same category. We're sinners. All of us are in need of a savior. So you might be asking, when is this passage, when is this happening? What's the time frame? Is this, is this as we're reading is this, is this something that did happen? Is this something that is happening? Or is this something that will happen? Yes. <laughs> uh, my dad mentioned this a moment ago. Oh, all the way back to the garden. You can go to Genesis chapter, chapter two. You can find the truth of God exchanged for a lie. So this is nothing new. This is humanity that is bent against God. But I want to I want to ask our junior high and our high schoolers to pay special attention to this passage. We're we're about to close out. I think this passage is instructive to us because we can see the progression, we can see the sin. I I, I read a report this past week, and uh, this report said every generation thinks that the generation behind them is worse off. <laughs> That's kind of funny, right? I thought it was funny. Um, I read this article. Here's a few of them. I pulled, these are just different articles. All right, here's the first one. What really distinguishes this generation from those before is that it's the first generation in America, in American history, to live so well and to complain so bitterly about it. Okay, but here's what's funny. This is written in the Washington Post, 1993. <laughs> so this is, this is, some of you guys are laughing. This was about you. How about this one? This is another good one. We defy anyone who goes out. This is probably my favorite. We defy anyone who goes about with his eyes open to deny that there is, as never before, an attitude on the part of young folk, which is best described as grossly thoughtless, rude, and utterly selfish. The Daily Mail, 1925. (laughs) I don't know. I thought that was great. Here's another one. Probably there is no period in history in which young people have been given such uh, emphatic of utterance to a tendency to reject that which is old and to wish for that which is new. The Evening News, 1936. Here's a good one. This one gives it away. <laughs> Millennials are lazy and think basic truths are beneath them. Daily Mail, 2017. <laughs> There's another one, and this is uh, many people were so, uh, many young people we're so pampered nowadays that they had forgotten there is such a thing as walking. This is the Falkirk Herald, 1951. This guy's complaining that young people are taking the bus when they should be walking. <laughs> How about this one? Speaking of another generation, they have trouble making decisions. They would rather hike in the Himalayas than climb a corporate ladder. They have few heroes, no anthems, no style to call their own. They crave entertainment, but their attention span is as short as one zap of a TV dial. Time Magazine, 2001. Again, talking about my generation. Here's a good one. This one's going way back. And I'll end with this one. The beardless youth does not foresee what is useful squandering his money. 
This is Horus, the, uh, the first century BC <laughs> poet, the Roman poet. So I want to say real quick, for the teenagers of Lancaster Baptist Church, there's a church family here that loves you and cares for you. And, and sometimes it's easy to think, well, there, you know, I, I want you to know that I don't sense that from anyone. What I do sense is a burden for you because you're living in unprecedented times. I do believe that the days have been evil and they've always been evil and they will continue to be e evil. But the evil that is available to you is unprecedented. Someone once said with the internet, it's like someone gave you a library card to the world, but no knowledge how to use a library or how to read. We need parents, teachers, godly men and this woman in this church to help young minds who now have access to everything, who've heard and read things that you would blush on, I'm speaking to an older gen generation, that maybe well into your adult life you, you weren't even aware of, they already know about it. So they have that, but what they don't always have is a processing and, and, and help to understand what is true and what is, what is not, what is harmful. We, we read in verse number 23 and 24, the object of their worship is no longer the creator, but the creature and the created. In, ver in verse number 25, we read, changed the truth of God into a lie. And then the, just the bucket list of sin gets poured out here, verse number 29 through 32. As you follow this list, there's, there's a progression here. There's intelligence. They knew God. There's ignorance. They glorified him not as God. They rejected God. There's indulgent into sin, and there's impenitence, which is sinning without remorse or regret. And the result is disaster. This is sin in their bodies, their behaviors, their being, even their minds. The Bible speaks of being reprobate, which speaks of being beyond hope. So how does this happen? And how is truth exchanged? And we're almost done. You know, in 2016, the word of the year uh, by Webster's Dictionary, the word was post-truth. Post-truth. Post-truth is an adjective defined as relating to denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than that which appeals to emotion and personal belief. The word of the year, 2016. So the world today teaches that truth is subjective. In fact, if you want to go debate truth on a... Uh, a public campus, a lot of times what you'll finally have to walk away from the debate with them acknowledging, well, that's your truth. So I can have my truth and you can have your truth, but there's no objective truth. What we find in scripture, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to understand that truth has been established. But the game of the devil and the game of uh, 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 the un end game, the end goal of the unrighteous and the ungodly is to exchange the truth for a lie. And that is happening every day. That has happened every day, going back to the garden. Someone once said, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. This is the law of propaganda. And we have lies that are repeated every day, on repeat, repeated, repeated lies every day. And I'm speaking to the teenagers and the young people in our auditorium because most of them are directed at you. Perversion in truth culminates in perversion in life. And so some of the truth that's being exchanged is, first of all, you are sexually free to decide who you are and who you're going to be with. With, and, and with no judgment, we should tolerate that. Tolerance is a buzzword. We all, we all tolerate things. We all don't tolerate some things. I'm glad that here at our church, we do not tolerate sex offenders working with young children. We don't tolerate that. That's where we draw the line. Everyone's okay with that. We're okay being intolerant, right? So we are all tolerant. We're all intolerant. It's just where we draw those lines. And, and so... We have to understand that, the, that, that uh, in our society, that, that the truth is being exchanged for a lie. 
I think of, and Paul highlights homosexuality here, so I'm going to speak for it in just a moment. And I want, I told Ashley today, I want my tone to be right because I believe as Christians we can speak the truth in love. Um, We can love our neighbor while not agreeing with them, while speaking the truth and praying for their repentance. I believe that. But I read um, recently just just the just the the public school calendar and how it celebrates LGBTQ students throughout the year. They're not just treated equally and fairly. They're revered for their bravery. The year long pride parade begins in October with coming out day, which is followed by these are all public school holidays, which is celebrated by International Pronouns Day and also in October LGBTQ History Month. November brings Transgender Awareness Week, capped off by Transgender Day of Remembrance. In March, there's Transgender Visibility Month. April contributes to the Day of Silent Day of Action to spread awareness for bullying and harassment of LGBTQ students. May offers Harvey Milk Day, dedicated to the mourning of the prominent gay activist uh, Harvey Milk. And in June, there is, of course, Pride Month, which we've all, if you've walked into any store or opened your eyes during the month of June, you're aware of this. So it's constant. It's this constant exchanging of truth for a lie. And you repeat the lie long enough, the law of propaganda is that it becomes the truth. Teens, here's what I'm afraid of. What the lie is this, that if you don't agree with this culture, you're a hateful bigot. And so what I see a lot of is kind-hearted people that say, I don't want to be a hateful bigot. We have to hold to the truth. I'm going to give you some some takeaways here in just a moment, but that is a lie. Don't buy that lie. Don't exchange the truth for that lie. You're not a hateful bigot. You are a child of God who answers ultimately to God, who revealed himself to you. Righteousness, wrath, knowledge of God. That's who you answer to, not someone that thinks something about you. Another lie that is so prevalent today is that your, your gender identity is fluid. That your gender is on a spectrum. And there's a bunch of different, I don't even, I wasn't going to look it up, I don't even care to look at how many different genders there are. You just make them up as you go. Uh, even on uh, U.S. passports now, I just heard this past week, they're, they're changing how U.S., there's no longer male and female. That's what we find in scripture, all right? So there's, there is this, transgender craze. And I don't use that word lightly. I read a book this past week. I think I got a picture of it and I forgot to put the name of it in my notes. Irreversible Damage. It's not a, not a Christian author, but a very insightful book. I would recommend anyone with daughters especially read this. In this book, um, it's called the transgender craze. That's a sociological term to speak to something that has gone socially viral. It's a craze. One of the reasons they say it's a craze is because the the prevalence of these instances happen more in clusters and groups of friends. It's not just like random, like a random diagnosis, like a like a sickness would be. This is more in clusters of of friends and groups, and it's 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 a craze according to uh, a, a sociological definition. I was talking to my wife about this, and she said. She says, you can't get that specific. It's a Sunday night service, and my girls are in here too. So I'm going to refrain from a lot of that, but it is wicked. The agenda, the target, again, uh, junior hires and high school uh, schoolers and parents as well. The youth of our society is being targeted. This book blew my mind, and I'm a youth pastor. I hear some of this. I had four conversations with parents this week about this issue. They were all vigilant parents. That were, that were wanting guidance on these issues, to their credit. But I read some of the things. There are evangelists for this lifestyle, and they will seek your kids out, and if they get an ear for your kids, they will, read the book, they will send your kids informations, clothing, and unmarked mailers so that you don't know where it's from, and they'll send it to you. They'll send it to your kids. Speaking of craze, when I was in high high school, I never remember one time preaching on this subject. And I was reading, in this book, uh, statistics were given. Between 2016 and 2017, the prevalence of these lifestyles quadrupled. 
In one decade, transgender prevalence is up 1,000% in America, 70% of them among girls. In Europe, it's up 4,000%. Maybe you read uh, and followed the election uh, recently in Loudoun County in Virginia, where parents, uh, thank God for them, got involved and understood what was going on. You realize that happens in our state? Do you realize that back in 2019, there was a meeting where the emergency measure that was placed in front of the uh, California Teachers Association, which met in Los Angeles, was whether or not that they should allow, it was a median action item to allow transgender uh, identified minors permission to leave campus for treatment without their parents knowing. Educators, activists, and legislators are studying California blueprints, New York, New Jersey, Colorado, Northern Virginia, Oregon. Public schools have already adopted these radical approaches to teaching young children sexuality. California boasts the most comprehensive statewide gender identity and sexual orientation instruction, which specifically bars parents from opting out. When asked why, one of the teachers said that parents are hopelessly inadequate to teach their kids sexuality. That's the world that we live in. That is a reprobate mind, a repression of truth. This is what it looks like. So here's some some things that we can do, and, and I'm done. As parents, as godly men and women in this church, As teens, here's what we can do. First of all, we can enter his presence. This is the whole point of the book of Romans, that we can have a relationship with God. So you read through, it is a progression. And it it starts with a rejection of God and the suppression of truth, unthankfulness, and and it goes on and on. So, so, So what can we do? I think first of all and foremost, we can develop a real relationship with God. I am thankful for every teen in Lancaster Baptist Church who goes to a camp and here's a gospel message. And even if they've been in church for a long time, maybe has, sometimes they'll call it a reassurance of salvation Amen. where they get saved. I love that. Amen. I think that there are many, and this is uh, in speaking to my children, you speaking to your children, I think it's important. I do believe the gospel is simple where kids can get saved, but I think they need to understand it. And, and, and one of my first questions to someone in this lifestyle, and, and I'll get to this in just a second, the context for this is to the, the Gentiles. These are unbelievers we're talking about. So what do we do with the, with the believers that fall into this category? My first question is, are they actually a believer? The Bible speaks of, of the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. We'll know them by their fruit. And so it should be concerning to you as a parent of a teenager that professes a relationship with Christ, and only they will answer before God, but never shows any fruit. That ought to be concerning to you. Jesus said that there would be those that said, Lord, Lord, that did things in his name, and he'll say, I never knew you. So my first question for someone in this lifestyle or following this progression is, are they saved? Here's the good news, is that this is sin, where where a sickness, I mean, you're you're stuck with it. With sin, there there is a free gift here in the book of Romans that fixes it, right? It's the free gift of salvation, and that is the good news. And so if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, here's the good news. It's available to you. Jesus paid it, uh, the price for it, on the cross of Calvary, and, 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 and you can be saved. That's the good news. So enter into his uh, presence. I, I think another thought would be just to express gratitude. Be grateful for the authority that you have in your life, teenagers. Uh, I think November's a great time because we're reminded of, of it's the month of giving, month of gratitude. I, I know at times I've felt thoughts of gratitude, but I've never expressed it. I think we've all, if we're not careful, we can do that. I want to challenge you this month to express your gratitude. Not just feel it, but to express it. And then I want to challenge you to parents and teens, all of us, to embrace truth and biblical authority. Embrace truth and and biblical authority. So what we have here in Romans chapter number one is a rejection of God's truth, a rejection of God's authority, and then by default, the authority that he's put here on the earth. So embrace that truth and biblical authority. Next, expose the lies. And this is parents where you go back to Deuteronomy chapter number six, and we are to teach children truth ongoing. 
When they get up in the morning, the Bible tells us, when they go about their day, when they lay down, when they sit down, that's how we're to teach our children truth. There are plenty of opportunities for it. What happens is we get busy and we get distracted. Don't, I love our youth department here. Don't sub out your parenting responsibility to the youth department or the children's department. It is your responsibility. It falls squarely on your shoulders to teach the truth. And so when you see something, when you walk into Target and there's flags all over the place and when there's something that's not right or there's a commercial or, or two guys are kissing, those are moments to teach the truth. And you can teach the truth and you can teach it in love, but you have to teach the truth. Embrace the truth and biblical authorities. Teens, if you have questions, there are people that want to answer your questions. Talk to your parents. Uh, talk to uh, some of the other youth leaders, the godly men and women in this church. Expose the lie then, and then experience God's blessing. There's a phrase that I, I didn't highlight as we went and I, I want to read. I want to finish with this. We find three times in this passage that they changed, they changed, they changed. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image like in a man. They changed the truth of God into a lie. The women did change the natural use, use and so we see them change, and change, and change. But there's three times, verse number 24, 26, and 28, where it says, then God gave them over. And God gave them over. And God delivered them, gave them over to a reprobate mind. He gave them up. He gave them up. He gave them over. What does this mean, that God gave them up or God gave them over? We started earlier on talking about God's wrath. And there is a future wrath. There's, there's a day God is going to judge. But what we find here in this passage is the wrath of abandonment. The wrath of God's abandonment. And it's not that... God abandoned you, but you abandoned him. We read of this in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, and I, I thought I pasted it, and I didn't have the verse, but there's, there's plenty of time. Here we go. You have forsaken me and served other gods, the Lord said to Israel, therefore I will deliver you no more. So you forsook me, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. This is the wrath of God's abandonment that God gave them up. And so a rebellious society, a godless society, Romans chapter number one, in which we're all... We're all guilty, right? We find the wrath of God's abandonment where God gave them over. Their, God's wrath experienced in their life was the folly of their sin. And that's why I could go through statistics and we can see there is, apart from God and his way given in his word, there's no satisfaction, there's no blessing, there's pain on the other side, there's regret, there's remorse. And so God's wrath here is shown by, I'm going to give them over. A few years ago, we had just finished up the spiritual leadership conference, and it was uh, back when we had it in June, if you remember that. And it was a long week, and my daughter, Blair, every time I picked her up from the nursery, we happened that week to park right out in this parking lot. And my daughter, Blair, every night she wanted to go to the fountain, right? Go to the fountain right there, and kids love water. So I'm holding her hand every night and she's trying to run ahead of me and I'm just, I'm restraining her. I'm restraining her. And I, 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 I'm telling her, no, no, wait for dad, wait for dad. You can't just go because I don't know what she's going to do, right? So that's Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. Well, Wednesday night, I'm tired. It's the last night. We're going to go home. I'm going to sleep, sleep in, you know, and I got, I got uh, Blair right there and she's trying to run for the, you know how kids do. She's running now. She's running sideways. Now she's on the ground. Now she's throwing a fit. Now I'm like, get up, make dad look bad, right? In front of everyone here at church. And so this last night, I didn't want to deal with it. When she took off, I just let her go. And here's what happened. <laughs> There's the next picture. There she is. She went in it. She kept her gum, right? She kept her gum. You can see that. What did I let her do? I let her do what she wanted to do. And she faced the consequences of that. And that's what we find in this passage, that God gave them up. Now, here's the thing I want you to remember. Did I ever stop loving Blair when I let her go? No. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, the people who walked in Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those that dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. I really believe that if we will hold to the gospel and preach the gospel, that it will be a light to those. And God will save them from even these lifestyles. 
I'll end with this. We read again and again that God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over the wrath of his abandonment. But that, you know, that's not the only time we read of this in scripture. In fact, in Romans chapter number eight, we read this, that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up. Here we find in Romans chapter one, he delivered them up. He gave them over. He gave them over. But in Romans chapter number eight, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The Bible tells us, and to wait for his son, this is 1 Thessalonians 1.10, from heaven, whom raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There's a wrath of abandonment. There's a wrath to come, and God's judgment will be executed in the earth. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You see, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. And that's why we can come to a passage like this, maybe a dark tunnel of scripture, and we can see through it the light of the glorious gospel. And we can thank God that he sent Jesus Christ to the cross, who satisfied the wrath of a holy and righteous God so that we can have a relationship with him. Let's declare the gospel. Let's teach the gospel. Let's teach truth. Let's not suppress the truth. Let's teach truth that is delivered to us in the word of God. And any time something contradicts the word of God, we're going with the word of God. Because ultimately, every knee will bound, bow. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ, I live. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and we're done. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. And know ye not that the, right un- know ye not that the unrighteous, we've heard about them tonight, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So I'm pausing here, and I'm turning here because... We know the context of Romans chapter 1 is to, it's to show that the whole world is guilty. The unbelievers, the Gentiles are guilty before God. But what about those who are saved? That's what we find here in this passage. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. In verse number 11, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So I want to end with these two verses now, verse 19 and 20, and we're done. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, here's our takeaway for us as believers. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's.